what I want to do is start the webinar and and really talk about this is going to be a little different. And the way I see this evening rolling is really just a conversation. I can promise you a couple of things. I don't have all the answers. Uh, I don't know which answers I have, but I know that someone on the webinar does. And that's what I learned from Mary and I learned from Lee and I learned from Joan Underschutz is the cafe conversation style, is all of the questions are in the room or in the webinar and all of the answers. And we don't know who holds which pieces. So I would invite you freely to interrupt me, uh, pop questions into the chat and Desi can check those and, and interrupt me as she likes. But I really would like the next 45 minutes or an hour to be an open conversation and discussion of the challenges that we're having. Because I, would, I think back on this title, managing new patients in challenging times, pre-COVID to me that meant, how do I find patients? And I think about my thin years and my lean years in practice is how do I actually get people to come see me? Now, just, I, I think it was this month or last month, uh, Desi and I put this together in the, in the Panky Insider. <clears throat> and I published this article called, what do you do when there's not enough you. And this was an article talking about time and resource challenges. And one of the biggest resource challenges we have is ourselves. We've all committed to an incredible CE journey and the more skilled and the more popular and the more known you become in your community, the more patients are gonna seek you out. Now that is a great thing, but the flip side of that is there's only so much you. You know, how many hours in the day, how many days in the week are you going to spend on patient care and what types of patient care? I remember back at, uh, at C1, way back in the day, I think in 2000, and they talked about pre-blocking my schedule. And I, I couldn't even fathom this concept. And what Chris Sager and what uh, Dr. Becker were telling me back then is they said, you're gonna run into a point that there's not enough time in your week for you to treat patients or for you to treatment plan patients. Uh, and I smiled and I nodded and I thought they were nuts because I wasn't busy enough and I couldn't even fathom providing this higher level of care. And I realized that regardless of whether you have an emergency clinic or whether you have a comprehensive care clinic, there's only so much of you to provide that type of care. And both of those practice models are actually good services to patients. So deciding what works for you and works for your practice and works for your family is one of the most important decisions. Now, Johnson Haygood called me uh, or texted me after this article came out and he said, are, have you been spying on my office? Uh, and and I, I called him, I said, what do you mean? And he goes, it's like you read my mind and put it down on paper. And it's not that I'm that insightful, it's that these are common challenges that we all face. And that was the birth of this webinar. I contacted Lee and I contacted Desi. And I said, you know, I had this idea, can we just get together and talk? And that's what I would really like this, uh, this evening to be about. And I would start, like to start and ask and open up the microphones and open this up to the floor is what kind of challenges are you experiencing right now in your practices? And I would frame that, as Mary Osborne loves to say that, I would frame that question as what challenges are you having right now with new patient flow? Uh, do you have too many? Do you not have enough? Do you not have enough space? Are you having a hard time breathing, practicing, and getting all the, all the work done? So I, I guess I would start out with that question and I would welcome some comments for people to, to uh, open up your microphones and go ahead and ask. Or if you like, you can throw something down into the chat. This is the interactive part. Otherwise we're gonna finish in like 10 minutes. Somebody's gotta help me out. Andy, Deanne, Ashley, reaching out and begging here for a little feedback. What is work? What is working for you, and what's not working for your practice? I noticed that when you know I live up in the in the woods in New Hampshire, and I find that we had a 
massive influx of people coming up from the Beltway and from the New York City area and from the Boston area and from that, that whole you know, upper New England coast. And we've actually absolutely become flooded with patients. And I never thought that I would encounter this kind of challenge in my practice. And Carlos and Monica, you said, you're having a, a, a bit of everything you mentioned. How are, if I could ask you, uh, Carlos and Monica, how are you, how are you managing that with your patient flow or what kind of challenges are you having? If you, if you don't mind tossing on your mic and if you don't want to, I, I'm not gonna pressure you to, but if you could share your thoughts or experiences, I would love that. So yes, we, we're having the issue, like you said, when we do a lot of treatment and then we get emergencies and it sort of flows in and out. And I like how that article mentioned the funnel because sometimes I feel I'm the only one in the funnel, but it's true where with the pandemic, everything has shifted a little bit. And how is that funnel working for you right now? So for example, this week has been a good week, but sometimes I find I don't have time for emergencies mm -hmm. or, or I have too many emergencies in one week. Okay. What does your team think about that? Um, I think it depends on the day, some days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because everybody in the office is going through challenges. Yeah, we are. And so depending on the day, you know, it goes well and not. Um, but overall, I think, how do I say this? It's just like, are we off the pandemic or not? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I absolutely get that. Yeah. Well, yeah. Th thank you. Thank you for- You thank are you. welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. So is anybody else, and Andy, you said, my present challenge is trying to get a close colleague to understand occlusion by slowing down and thinking and reading more because a suck down has worked for the dentist and their mother and many patients get tooth wear. So in, integrating integrating the, the, and regardless of the skill set, but Andy's bringing up something specific with occlusion. And Pandaria says, our new patient exams are not consistent. Not everyone is getting the same experience. And sometimes there's miscommunication from the front to the back. Could, could you expand on that a little bit? Would you, if, if, you're, if you're comfortable turning on your microphone, could you share some of the, the challenges that you're experiencing? Uh, yes. So I'm actually a front desk team member. And one of our biggest focuses for this year, we're trying to get a little better with our new patient experience mm -hmm. to make sure things are consistent from patient to patient. So there are certain protocols doctor would like in place, but um, I realize that doesn't always happen for each patient. So we're just trying to figure out a way to make it more consistent. So all of those things that he wants for the exam are already on hand or done each patient is getting the same experience for that first appointment. And when they're going from the back to the front, what their next steps are will be well communicated. Right. Just jotting, just jotting down a few notes here. What, what's sort of the flow that I envision in the, in the discussion with the, with the webinar this evening is I wanna talk about challenges and I, I love that people are sharing those. Then I want to talk about you know some of the restrictions that we are putting in place uh, that are you know barriers to our patients coming in, and then I'd really as we move forward towards the end, I'd like to talk about time management, and also talk about how, as you say, how we're bringing these patients in, and how we flex to that, and if we're actually willing to flex, because there are some of us that are going to be you know more flexible. And there are going to be other ones that are going to be very rigid in how we practice. And there's nothing, I, I, I would like to clarify and be very straightforward on this. There is not a right or wrong. And what is right for me in my practice is not necessarily right for you in yours. And so I don't want anyone to feel bad if they're not doing it the panky way. And you've heard this a million times. There was only one or two panky practices whether it was Dr. LD or whether it was, uh, you know, Dr. Panky, the orthodontist or Dr. Panky, the physician. 
So um, any, other, any other thoughts or any other unique challenges that haven't been mentioned so far? And Laura, you said limited capacity for new patients in our practice as a new practice owner less than a year. And this was a topic of conversation. And uh, you know, that's a that's a great problem to have, but it's also a terrible problem to have. And that was one of the reasons that I wrote that article. What do you do when there's not enough you? Is we are high achievers and we want to be successful. And one of the, one of the aspects of that success is getting lots of new patients. But then you get so many new patients that you can't actually put more new patients and there's not enough you. So what I as we, as we continue this, what I would like to talk about is being aware of those time and resource limitations. And I love that there are team members on here because how do we involve and how does the team involve us in this process? And that's absolutely a two-way street because we, we are a team. And you know what are our new patient pathways? And I wanna talk about something that is near and dear to my heart which is how do we change to stay the same? Because things that worked in the past are not necessarily gonna work now. And things that worked, Laura, when you were less busy are not the same challenges you have now. And through that evolution and through those challenges, how do we maintain our core values? How do we maintain our trueness to our philosophy, our mission, our team, and our goals? And I'd like to go back to that comment about the funnel. And this is a discussion I'm sure many of you have heard from existing faculty members. I heard it from Dr. Gary DeWood uh, when he was at the Institute. And he said, there are different points in your career when the funnel is turned in different directions. And as you can see the funnel as it exists here, it's open at the top and it's limited at the bottom. And when we're earlier in our career, or Laura, when you were starting maybe you know, a year ago, I remember those times doing, doing a scratch start. And that first time the phone rang, it was like in Ghostbusters. You know, if you've seen Ghostbusters and the phone finally rings and the lady hits the, hits the alarm and says, we got one. We literally did that in Spokane. And I remember dancing around the front desk and we were all doing like the polka. Well, I'm from Wisconsin. Deanne knows that. So we were, all, we were all doing, you know, the cha-cha and whatever. And it was exciting. The criteria for a new patient to come into our practice back then was a pulse and a purse. And the purse wasn't a criteria because we would take anyone as long as we can get them in. It didn't really matter. With this approach, what you see is you take anyone and everyone into that funnel, which means at the bottom of the funnel, you only get a certain amount of the types of patients you want and the types of treatment that we are all training to provide. Now, at a different point in our careers, that funnel is going to turn upside down. And it took a long time for me to realize that funnel that Gary talked about could be turned upside down and the entrance criteria could be incredibly rigid. That could be a two hour examination with a comprehensive exam, full mouth x-rays, a pano, 22 pictures, two sets of study models, and, and so on and so forth, CBCT, JBA, whatever, what have you. Now that's very restrictive and that may, mean, may seem unfair to patients, that may seem elitist, but one of the things that I had to embrace with my, within my career and my journey within the Institute was I'm putting an amazing amount of work, effort, and financial investment in my training to be, quote unquote, that dentist that I didn't even know what that dentist was supposed to be 20 years ago. But I realized that there are times that I can't see emergency patients, and that is not that is, that, that's not being mean or that's not being uncaring. It's being true to what I can offer because the more I pack up seeing just emergency patients, that means there's a whole nother subset of my patients that aren't available to get that care. <clears throat> and I remember Gary telling stories back in Pemberville, Ohio, and mm -hmm. how it came to that point in his career, people would say, uh, you know, call his office and they'd say, 
are you taking new patients? And they said, well, uh, can I ask you a few questions? Do you have, are you aware of any significant dental needs that you'd like to address? And what, what his front desk was doing was really screening, not only are they aware that they have needs, is do they want to address them? And I remember Gary, and they said, no, just regular cleaning. And I remember Gary sharing the story. He was like, well, that's fine. We have, we have a, an opening next year in June. Or he might have said, you know what? That's fantastic, and we're so happy for your dental health. There is another office in town that we refer our healthy patients to who are excellent at providing that, that level of care. And I thought about that story and I was like, that is crazy. I can't even imagine ever having that many new patients. And lo and behold, this last year, I found myself referring those new patients to a new uh, husband and wife couple in town and using those same lines. And it felt weird and it felt strange, but that funnel can turn up and down and sideways in our career. It's not a linear progression. You can go back and forth between those two and again, I, I guess I'll, I'll open that up a little bit. Are you experiencing that? Is in, and where are you at with your funnel currently? Because I tell you, right now, I don't care which way my funnel is. This is how it feels. I feel like I'm getting waterboarded because I, yeah, I don't care if I turn it up, I turn it down. It's overflowing over the sides. And um, it, it's, it's an absolute challenge bringing people in. Does, I, does anybody want to comment or share your stories or your challenges or your thoughts on, on the funnel and what's happening in your area of the country? I, good evening. Can anyone hear me? Yes. My name is Ben Clayman. I'm in a, in a small town, Red Bank, New Jersey. Dan, I think uh, you might recognize me. Good to see you. Um, we've had... Uh, you know, if you if you set up your practice well, pre-screen patients on the phone, you know, and, and you really kind of set the right first impressions, easy to find. You said, the, the, we call them the dry cleaning patients. I just want my teeth clean. <laughs> same, you can't just drop them off. We need, you know, I, I need a checkup. How do you check up someone you haven't met before? Um, so we've had great success in converting people, getting people on, but, you know, you get the people that are easy to say, oh, you know, that's okay with me, or can I get my cleaning the same day? So part of that is trying to make people happy but also trying to pre-screen so you keep, you make room for the more quality patients and let those that aren't looking to invest or be a part of their care. You know, we found with, with coming back from COVID, there were those that had been out of, the, out of dentistry for a few, a year, two, three years. And mm -hmm. they came in, they got their exam, they got their cleaning, maybe a little treatment. And what they heard is basically, it's okay to go a few years again. And we found they didn't come back after six months or a year. And, um, <laughs> That was 2020. 2021 was an influx of good patients. This year, we found it's a similar thing. People now have been out for two years since COVID. And as they've come back, you know, hearing it's not a six month thing, they're okay disappearing every two years, but finding those people and how to, when they call, how to be aware of what they're telling us that first time, you know, or listen, it's been two years since the shutdown. Where have you been? You haven't been to a dentist. Why? And, you know, trying to find that on the phone beforehand. Mm -hmm. So when they say, well, I'll stick around for two hours to get my teeth cleaned and get my new patient exam, it's like, that's usually a warning sign. You know, it's because they just want their teeth cleaned and not every cleaning is the same. And, and so that's been kind of that challenge of, as everyone's talking about having, you know, the funnel, the room of how to help, you know, we want to help everybody and money's money, but standards is one thing and the people that truly want, like you were mentioning, people that truly want to help themselves versus those that just want to clean their teeth and move on. Mm -hmm. it's, it's how to, again, I, I guess what I mean to say is how to better pre-screen that or better when your know, patients, not everyone looks us up, found you on Google. Did you look at a website, you know, did you, or was it just, you found us on your insurance uh, portal? Does, does that make sense? I kind of did a little rambling there, but. No, I, I, I think you, you stated that really well then. And, and how are you dealing with that, that screening? How are you guys managing that? Um, we, my team is very thorough of, of you know, they've gotten very, they're very good and they've gotten better at picking up those warning signs and kind of as they hear that kind of, well, here, you know, we like to do here. We always like, you know, we can't do a checkup on the scripting part of it, of how to find those phrases and, and help people understand. And if we find if they're a little tentative, there's a positive tentativeness where it's like, oh, that's a good experience. Like, don't, wouldn't you want to be examined first? Like, yeah, I guess so. Versus those, no, I just really want my teeth cleaned. It's like, well, 
And then the more eager they are to stick around for two hours, the bigger that warning sign is. So mm -hmm. sometimes those people are, they'll take, you know, they'll go anywhere they can get. So when you book two hours, they don't show up. Right. And so being aggressive versus when we need money to hold your appointment. But if it's like, well, two hours, a lot of time for a new patient generally require a deposit. And if they balk at that, generally, it's, you know, you can tell they're a shopper. And if they don't balk at it, generally, you can tell they're committed. So just kind of getting better at those warning signs. And, you know, people are people. There's only so many warning signs. There's only so much that we're going to hear to be, you know, on the lookout for. Right. So, and even though there's a range of it, but, you know, it, part of it too, again, it's been, you know, it's been two years. Where have you been? Mm -hmm. That's one of those things. Well, why has it been two years to come back? You know, were you COVID afraid or were you, you're just one of those people that waits every few years and I, let me make sure everything's okay and then disappear and, it's great, but we have patients that, you know, need to see us every three months, six months, new patients that come in need perio or, you know, a few rounds of cleaning to get caught up And these right. the best patients are taking up those spots. You know, some, some of the things, if I may just kind of, kind of flip around on you, I think a lot of the things that you say are absolutely true. And some of the things that you say are things that we've trained patients to say, I want to establish care. Oh, do you want a cleaning? Yeah, I want a cleaning. And they're, they're saying what we want to hear and what we as a profession have trained them. And I, I, I'm always going to go back to the why. Someone says, I just want to get my teeth clean. I'm like, that's fantastic. I say, can you help me understand why that's important? Well, you know, I don't want to lose my teeth. Boom, you got a reason. I said, why would losing your teeth be, be a challenge for you? Well, God, that'd be horrible. I, you know, I wouldn't be able to eat. Okay, so nothing going on. You just want to get your teeth clean because you want to keep eating and not lose your teeth. Yeah. You know, the, one of the best ways to do that is really to let the doctor see where you're at now so you can avoid those things in the future. And now I have a why before I tell them that they have to go through our hoops. The, uh, say most of our patients that are concerned about their health, like you are, uh, I really enjoy actually spending some solid quality time with a doctor. I know you don't get to experience that, or you, maybe you haven't experienced that in a lot, and our patients do. Would you be interested in that? And they say, yeah, that sounds great. Then you can tell them about that. I think if we're putting up the barriers too early, well, all of our patients have two hours. All of our patients have full mouth. All of our patients have records. All of our, and that's what the patients are hearing and seeing is how can we make it more about them? And when we talk about understanding, that's one of the tenets that Stephen Covey talks about is first seek to understand, then be understood. And I, I feel like I'm parroting uh, Mary and Mary and, and, and Mary Osborne and Joan Undershitz a, a bit, but it's hard to answer questions and convince people when we don't know what their question is and what their why is. And so, and I know this is definitely going to vary in different cities. And you know, some people are have high competition levels and they'll just go where someone's going to let them in easiest. And education isn't always easy. And that's what I said, I don't have all the answers. But I felt a lot of the challenges, I guess, that you would say, Ben, I, and I appreciate you rambling and babbling on because actually I think you said what pretty much everyone in the room has probably experienced at some point in their career. And if they haven't, they will. Thank you. So that waterboarding funnel in a lot of our practices is starting to feel like this is it's not a little trickle out the end you are getting water by a fire hydrant and whether you are successful in bringing patients in or you have those challenges the volume is increasing that we're finding both of these one of the things that uh, johnson haygood and i were talking about the other day was this is are you accepting new patients and you know our and you're talking about that, we are not accepting new patients. We're not accepting new patients until June or September. Here in, here in, in where I live, uh, we're booking, offices are booking out till June, July, September, October, and even November. And why does it take that long? Because we're controlling our schedules with pre-blocking. And those things where we don't have enough time for emergencies, Paul and I, I think, are, I think we take each two, pa two new patients a week and that pretty much maxes us out. That's the way our funnel is turned, is that we're at a point that we're being fairly restrictive to our inflow, that it is that two, two hour 
new patient exam. And I go back to one of the questions that, that Gary asked, you know, is when we talk about these things is how much and how many, what do you want? How much money and how many new patients, how many days off and figuring all this out balances into the answering this question about accepting. And I, I guess I'll throw this out to, to Ben or Laura or Deanne or anyone is our, is this a reality where you live? I mean, it, do, do we have enough new patients? Do you have too many new patients or do you have not enough of the type of new patients that you want? And how are, how are you managing that? Mike, I can uh, say, obviously I'm not in private practice any longer, but at the time that I was, up until the time I was leaving, we had a fair amount of new patients. And I think just going back in the history of my learning, uh, I was like you, when I, when I went to C1 and I learned the comprehensive exam, that was really something that was important to me. And so I had in my mind that for every single new patient, I had to do all these things on. And it would stress me out when, when I would be in the preclinical conversation and it would be going long and I'd be thinking, how am I going to get all the x-rays taken and the models done and the photographs and <laughs> everything? Because I was a person where when they said, this is what you should do, that's what I wanted to do. And the turning point, you know, I had, I had actually had some success with that, but I had some really good people at the front desk who believed in me and what I was doing. But the turning point for me was when I allowed myself to let the patient dictate how much was going to be done that day and what was going to be done and the most appropriate thing that was going to be done for them. Like eventually we might get that all done, but it mm -hmm. wasn't going to be in that first hour and a half or whatever appointment, we may not get all of it done. And once I released myself of that and said, I'm going to do for this patient what is most appropriate for them and then they became more in charge of it, it, then it just like went exponentially because the person felt more um, that they were with me, you know, like, like we were together as a team. So I think for me, that released so much pressure off of me, not having to get everything done the first appointment or, you know, whatever. And, and so I think instead of the filter changing, my uh, service changed to, because, how, why would, if we're going to do individualized treatment, why would we do the same thing on every person? And I was like, duh, duh. Say that five more so, times. Let's all yeah, go that get really that. helped me um, tailor each appointment time. So I did what was most appropriate in that hour and a half or two hours for that patient. And then the next time moved on. So that was very helpful for me. Dan, thank you so much for sharing that. I remember in my C1 manual, they, they had a list of recommendations and advice from previous attendees and visiting faculty. And the one that always stuck out to me to this day and still does, it said, a comprehensive exam may take 10 years. And it's like, oh my God, I'm slow, but I'm not that slow. And what I realized was the words that you just said is meeting the patients where they are. And Ben, when you talk about the two hour new patient exam, I don't always tell people that it's two hours. And when they come in, and like today, I had a, a, at a, at a patient that was a fairly involved uh, pain patient, and we were done with the exam in 45 minutes. And that was, she, she was a driver, she know what she wanted to say, she know what she wanted to talk about. We got through periodontal charting, we got through photos, we got through you know full heart tissue charting. And after that point, she was done. But what I hear, whether I do a two hour exam or a 45 minute exam, I always finish it, almost always finish it. I said, wow, I bet you I've talked about your teeth more than anyone ever has, uh, unless I, they're referred by a panky dentist. Then Charlie sent a, sent a few up my way. But they said, yeah. And I, and I said, how did I do? And I said, what did you think about that? And they said, this was great. I said, what, what was great about it? And said, no one's ever listened to me. And that doesn't, that isn't time relative. And sometimes I want to take the models, but it's not, I can, I get that feeling it's not right. And I almost always like to take photos, but sometimes I can feel that they don't trust me enough to be that vulnerable. And they don't, I don't get turned down on photos too often, but that 10 year new patient exam, 
the other word for that is it's a journey. And if I can get those people in, even if I have two hours, and if I don't use the whole two hours, hallelujah, because I have some time to do my paperwork and lab work and actually work up the treatment plans. So I, I think that wise Wisconsin folk like Deanne are sharing, you know, the, the, not the successes, but the struggles that we put up mentally and the barriers that we, that we put up. Ben, ben is, that, is that helpful? Please say yes, my mom might be listening. <laughs> um, there you go. Generally, we, we, new patient visits are about an hour. We, I don't like, we don't like clean teeth that first visit. Sometimes they, they're a lot less than drivers, simple, healthy people. I like to allocate that hour. Um, mm -hmm. It just gives us time to have a good conversation. You know, I'm, I'm sure like most of you guys, if the treatment's simple, we can discuss it then if it's complex, you know, we have a good system of bringing them back, hygiene, treatment, presentation. Some people, the awesome. priorities of cleaning, great others. It's the cleaning is just part of the treatment, you know, when let's sit and so that hour just gives us room. Some people it takes more, they're talkers. And, you know, you're yeah. trying to hold this conversation and like, and, you know, I mean, we all know a clinical exam on someone that's relatively healthy is simple. Some people we can take records at visit. They're old, like Dan was saying, like sometimes you can take records. Great, let's do this. Other people, you know, all right, we'll see you next time. We'll talk a little more. But that hour is a, is way more than enough time, you know, for, for the 27 year old that needs retainers and and two fillings. It's 40 minutes. Like you said, great. I get to paperwork. We can we can you know have a little time to breathe. And for the complicated case that isn't aware of the complications, you're not even doing records at visit. You're just kind of helping them along on their path. And, you know, oh, tell me a little more about this. How'd you get there? And really, like you said, listening. And usually you get to the point at the end, they're like, you know, I've never talked to any doctor like that. No one or no doctor's ever listened to me like that before. And you really all, you only, you have no clinical findings. You have no treatment plan. You just have a human that gave you a little bit of them. I, I, I love, I love the way you say that. I, I love that. Please, please continue. Uh, that's no, that's about yes, how it's working. And you know, most patients love it. When we, like you said, we find their why. Most patients are very, very, you know, well, wouldn't you want the doctor to find your mouth? Wouldn't you find the right cleaning for you? Or they're good at finding the insurance driven people. Don't you want to you know, know what you're no, not have any surprises and keep, you know, it's been a year. So we're good at, like you said, like I was saying before, we're good at finding that why or having them land into our little trap of our scripting, right? Once they give us that clue, all right, let's, we can work, we can, you know, kind of funnel them into. You know, nodding along. Um, it's just the rare few that either are good at you know following along or are a little more pushy. No, I just want my teeth clean. No, I just want my teeth clean. Well, why do you want your teeth clean? It's been a while. How long has it been? I don't know. Well, when was the last time? I don't know. And, you know, it's kind of. Does that make sense? It does, and it, and I think there, are, you know, there are no magic bullets, and some of those people that do push and are not perhaps mislabeled by us, you know, that it's true that they don't, are, they're not even open to valuing what we do. And if we're that busy, and sometimes those are the ones that we turn away. And we, the flip side that you also said is when you have someone that's really talkative, and I, 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 again, I feel like sometimes I'm just a, a Mary Osborne marionette puppet, and you, you don't even see her lips moving when I talk. But she said, I got, I was talking to Mary and I said, Mary, I'm having a really hard time because I'm having these great preclinical interviews, but I'm running out of time to actually do stuff. And she says, is that a problem? And I was like, I, I don't know. She goes, well, you're asking the wrong person. You need to ask the patient. And so what I came to ask the patient is when I hit that time, and I used to actually very harshly segment my new patient exam, at least within my head. And I knew that if I talked with them longer than 10 minutes, I was not going to be able to finish everything. And what the phrase, magic phrase that Mary gave me was, you know what, we're having a really wonderful conversation that I know is going to help, allow me to help you better. But I also know you had an expectation that I should look at your teeth today. Is it more important for you today for us to keep talking? Or is it more important for us to go look at your teeth? And some of those say, no, we need to keep talking because you're finding things out about me that I didn't even realize. And someone else might say, yeah, you know, this is enough talking. You kind of hurt my brain already. Can, you, can we go look at the teeth? I'm like, absolutely. And I think that's where Deanna is saying, meet the patient where they are and follow their lead. 
And it's funny that when we let go of the steering wheel, someone else has it and they might take us to a place that we didn't even realize that was possible. And I've seen poor people or you know, lower blue collar say yes to full mouth rehabs when they were insurance dependent and driven. Because values, I, right now I live in Hanover, New Hampshire. I, I have billionaire patients and I have quite a few of them. I've never had that in my life. In Spokane, I had a couple of millionaire patients. But having practiced in Packwood, Washington, where I lived in a 12 by 20 log cabin, and some of my patients paid me with elk meat and firewood, I found that there isn't a whole lot of difference between those people and billionaires, because some will say yes, and some will say no, and it's my, my decision for, to make for them. So I think when we become open to possible, open to possibilities, is that's where life can kind of just surprise us. Yeah, I saw you laughing and giggling, so. So that kind of brings me to the, the next slide. And another one of my, I love quotes, is we have to change to stay the same. Because the challenges that we face now in, with COVID are very different than we had before. But we want to maintain what I, what I referred to before was, was that core philosophy uh, that we have, however you have developed yours and however I have developed mine. And when we, when we talk about that, it goes back to that Gary question is how much and how many? How many new patients do you need? And I, and I would love to actually hear whether it's uh, in the chat or people want to chime in. Do you have a new patient goal? Do you have a new patient limitation? Uh, you know, is it, is it two a week? Is it six a week? Is, and I don't even care. I, this isn't a comparison thing. As, as Jay, bless his heart, would say, and Buzz shares the lesson, comparison is the thief of happiness. I'm not here to shame anyone for having too many or too few patients. But I think it's important for all of us to be aware of what we want. Because if we don't have a goal, we are never have enough. And if we don't have that goal, we don't have an understanding on how to get there. So I, I, do we have, you know, within, within the room, do you, have a, do you have an awareness of how many new patients you have? Just kind of yes, no questions, just tossing out there. Yeah, like I like about four a week. That's a good number. I like that. So I'm sorry. It's, it's late. It's eight, it's eight whatever here. <laughs> I'm getting a little punchy. All right, so if no one if no one's going to chime in on that, that that one's okay. But with that, it, it brings up what I was talking about. In order to have accomplishment, we have to have goals, because otherwise we're always grinding that wheel. We need more. We need more. We need more money. We need more patients. We need more of this. We need more of that. But if we bring back and control our environment, is how many new patients? Where do you want to put them? When do you do your best work? How do you pre-block? How do you do all those things? So looking at that, I, I would ask, how are you bringing new patients into your practice now? And has that changed? And I'll say, how are you bringing new patients into your practice now? And has that changed? And if we could frame that, let's say, since COVID. Andy down in uh, Trinity Tobago says, I see about two to three new patients per week. And my new patients are by referral despite COVID. Andy, has that changed? Um, and, and if you don't mind popping your mic on, love to hear your voice because I miss you. <laughs> Hi, Mike. I'm a bit croaky tonight. <clears throat> it's uh, practice has changed just because of some of the restrictions that we had when practices couldn't work normally and just had to see emergencies. So we could decide what was an emergency, but by and large, my practice hasn't changed that much. Despite COVID, it, if, if anything, it's got busier. So people seem to have been... Uh, doing more damage to teeth in all the lockdown and all the stresses that have come along with COVID and uh, not being confident and maybe having a job in the next few months for many people. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it has increased for me. I know it hasn't for everyone. Yeah. It's been as unfortunate. Well, if I, and, and one, if I could give a small introduction, Andy, Dr. Andy Miles, uh, he's a British dentist who, uh, what'd you say, 
went to visit Trinidad and Tobago for a year to check it out. And that was about 30 years ago. And he hasn't quite made his decision if he's staying. Uh, he's a wonderful friend, but he's also an amazing mentor. Uh, Andy is prosthodontic level skills and occlusion and rehabilitation. And he spends wow. a great deal of his time mentoring younger dentists. He's brought occlusion knowledge to Trini Tobago. He's brought a group of dentists up to my office. He's, Janine and I have gone down, our, our endodontists have gone down to uh, do programs there. So he's really, really doing God's work uh, down there. But when you bring up that, and you say some people run into these challenges and some don't, and talking to a lot of panky dentists, I'm finding that the COVID challenge and the COVID benefit is we're set up to accept patients for what they're looking for right now. Whereas a lot of people don't know how to manage the time. They don't know how to manage the patient flow. And Ben, when you were talking about that, these people that have been out of the loop for two or three years and yeah, bless their hearts. I've seen some come in that it looked like they had their teeth clean last week and they're apologizing like, oh my God, I haven't, I haven't been had a cleaning. I don't even want you to look at my face. I'm looking, I'm like, you had your teeth clean like yesterday, right? But you also have those ones that fall through the, fall through the cracks. And I remember a patient coming in and saying, you know, I hate COVID because I was so committed for the first time in my life going through a periodontal program and getting my grafting done and getting my, uh, my, my disease managed. And then all of a sudden for two years, he couldn't go in for care. And he completely regressed to the point that he could possibly lose about eight of his teeth. And I think that's where as caring, compassionate, panky trained dentists, we are rising to the occasion or we have the ability to rise to the occasion to provide a level of care for patients that are so much in need because across just across the globe these people haven't been in in ages and whether it's progression in perio or occlusal issues or decay restorative needs uh you know i hate covid but from a business standpoint it's really giving us an opportunity to help a lot of people that really need what we've all been trained to do yeah couldn't agree more, Mike. Well said. Does any could any does anybody want to? I'd love to hear some other thoughts. And how are you bringing new patients in your practice? And if that's changed during COVID? Hey, Mike, I got I got a question for you. It's along the lines of this. This is uh, Dennis Ragoza. So I recently just joined a practice with a good friend of yours who's in actually in this lecture. Um, I don't want to mention his name, but um, he, um, you know, he is, he's built a practice where he gains all his patients as referrals from specialists. I mean, he probably gets over 85% mm -hmm. of referrals from specialists. And I mean, a typical great month for him is bringing in six to eight patients. And he was getting to a point where he's bringing in over 10 patients a month. And he reached out to me one day and he said, Hey, look, I, I need some help. Uh, this was during COVID. And, you know, at that moment, when, when that opportunity was presented to me, I, I jumped on it and I joined his practice. And, and now we're, we're kind of like in this phase where I'm trying to build my practice. And instead of him being able to cut back, he's now finding himself working more. And <laughs> also, at the same time, we're trying to uh, attract more new patients so that I can get my schedule busy. So it's like, you know, it's like a combination of problems that are going on, trying to figure out how to make this work. And I was wondering if you might have any thoughts on that. So Dennis, is your, your question is, how do you build your practice more? Um, it's, I mean, it's the overall big picture and he's he he really has a devoted following and it's it's uh you know you it's hard to try and try and get somebody to feel comfortable with a new provider in a practice i totally get that and then also um I mean, we're also trying to figure out how to get new patients. I mean, it's never been 
as I mean, it's been a long time since he's marketed patients, so marketed yeah. for patients. So that's like a whole new realm. I feel like we're starting all over again from square one in this modern day and age. Dennis, I, I, two things, if I could answer it this way. Um, yes. One is outside of this webinar, I'd be more than happy to spend some private phone time with you to talk okay. about. Within this webinar, I'll tell you, I, you know, I've been in Hanover for uh, 10 years, I guess, coming this November, and it felt like exactly what you're talking about. The guy who I bought my practice from practiced here for 40 years, and I came in at 46 years old, and people were looking at me like I was a recent grad. Yeah, and I was, you know, I was already teaching, I was, you know, accomplished in my restorative skills, my surgical skills. And they thought I was literally fresh out of dental school. And the answer that you might not like so much is it takes time. Is I, but I introduced myself to every patient, every opportunity I could. I went out and sat in the waiting room and said, hey, I heard a lot about you, just want to introduce myself. It's just little touch things like that. At the same time, the, the dentist that was retiring, or if even if you have uh, your dentist partner or boss or whatever you want to say, is he needs to, or I would, I would encourage him to make that effort to say, you know what, uh, I know I've been seeing you for a long time. Uh, Dennis is a fantastic practitioner. Would you be interested in meeting him? And that's one of the things, meeting him, not having him provide your treatment, is having him be an active uh, advocate for you. Dan, I'm, I'm sorry to pester and bother you, but if, if you're still around, I would love for you to weigh in on that because I know that you've had a lot of experience that with you know Marquette grads that you've mentored and that you've brought through your practice. Can you can you share a little bit of that because you had a you had a wonderful uh, following out in the in the West Burbs. Well, I was just typing in that the more I I went in with my uncle, so I was. Um, he was in practice for 36 years before I joined him. And um, the more he promoted me, the easier it was for me to gain his patience then. So I, I totally agree with what you said, um, that the team has to promote the new doctor and the elder uh, partner needs to promote the younger associate or the partner coming in. And so that was really helpful. I happened to be his niece, so that was a little helpful as well. But I did the same for Chris, you know, and, and my first associate, Donna, um, was with me for eight years before she went into practice with her husband. And I, I really promoted the, my associates so that the patients would accept them because you, you do have the person that's there the longest does have the, the biggest following. And so I think one, they will trust who you trust to be the next person or the associate or the partner. So I, I think that really, really is key. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Why, why were you just sitting in the waiting room the whole time waiting? <laughs> I'm sorry? Were you, were you just, what were you doing sitting in the waiting room, not looking awkward, other than just sitting in the waiting room? Oh, no, I would go out in the waiting room and just say hello. I wouldn't be sitting oh, there. Okay hanging out okay. that'd, 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 that'd be i thought you were reading the same pamphlet over and over again <laughs> that's hilarious all right uh, that's really I, think, <laughs> I think one of the other things that that we did as and i and i'd be happy to share this with you is we we made a tear sheet for paul and i each paul is my is my is my uh work partner and, and practice partner we each own half of the practice uh, but we, and I'd be happy to share this and, and give this to Desi and she can share with whoever is, you know, it has our, a picture, a little bit of our story, a little bit of our family history, a little bit of our philosophy of dentistry, and a few logos down at the bottom that might be ADA, AGD, uh, you know, Panky, ICOI, whatever, just a little bit to let people, it, it's basically a brag sheet to let people know about who you are. And all those little pieces are those little little stepping stones that'll get you there. I, and I and I apologize, but th the truth is there's no magic key. And you know, great results take great effort. And there, but there, the nice thing is there is a tipping point where all those referrals that your partner 
is experiencing and all those referrals that Deanne and Andy and I talk about, those will become your stories that you'll be telling someone like I am right now. And maybe in a few years, you'll be giving a webinar talking about the lean years and uh, how they're, you know, distant memories, but you know, you can, you can still share your fresh experiences with, with, uh, with colleagues in the future. So there's my, there's my, uh, what do you call that self-fulfilling prophecy suggestion for that hopefully you will be telling. So I, I can't and imagine, you know, I look, you can't see it behind me, but I have my C1 uh, certificate up and that's the only one I keep up in my private office. Uh, I used to keep up my four, my whatever, to show how far I've come. Uh, but I realized how far I've come is defined by where I started, not where I finished. And uh, so, I don't know. Thank you, thank you so much. I mean that that's already a tremendous help. Mm -hmm. I, I have to say, I have to say, my boss is one of the most amazing people ever. I mean, he he tries to punt new patients to me. He doesn't want to see more new patients. <laughs> he's he's literally trying to follow them follow them to me, and he'll he'll see a new patient. He says, "You got to see this guy." Nice. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's an amazing setup, and every everything that you guys are saying is is really really helpful. Well, I'll give this, I'll give this out to you notice. My, my cell phone is 509-868-7790. And my email is info at michaelmelkers.com. Reach out to me as you need, and I would be more than happy. And I'd like to hear some of the stories behind the webinar that you, you said you'd share privately. But, uh, you know, be your, be your uh, accountability partner or just an ear to, to bend from time to time if you like. Really You're appreciate welcome. that. You're welcome. So I guess the last question I, I would ask for you, even though the, the webinar went in a different direction, I don't even know if we have to talk about this, is how can you bring patients in your practice differently and are you willing to change? I think that we've already talked about this, is does the patient want to come in for a two hour or sometimes would you just like to come in and meet Dennis? Yeah, I'd like that. Well, we can set up five or 10 minutes so you can just sit down. And that's one of the, that's one of the no barrier uh, times that I remember doing that here in Hanover, but I also remember doing that back in Spokane, where someone was, you know, averse to committing the either the time or the money because they didn't know me and I wasn't very good at communicating over the phone and my team wasn't either. Uh, they didn't have the confidence in me because I didn't have the confidence in myself. But as I was given the chance for them to meet me, as as Deanne talked about, as Andy talked about, my confidence grew. Uh, in myself and how I presented myself. So what I would say to you, Dennis, and I, you, 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 you took you and Ben took the webinar definitely a different direction, which was actually a wonderful gift to the group, is sharing a lot of these these challenges, sharing a lot of these stories, sharing your vulnerability, uh, and, and where we are. I think that's one of the one of the absolute strengths of the institute is it's a safe place to learn, to share, and grow, and we nurture each other. So I, I do wanna be respectful of everyone's time. We are at an hour. I will also add one more opportunity. Lee and I were just chatting, Dr. Lee Bra Leanne Brady and I were just chatting earlier today about this webinar and how some people were very excited about it. And Eva is gonna actually be gathering names if you're interested. And we're actually gonna have an ongoing, ongoing aspect of this, of a, a practice management practice manager, or just want to work on your practice learning group. It'll be online where we can have different topics. I, I have no idea how often this is going to happen. This is all of like four hours old. So this hasn't been in the planning. It's just some crazy thought that popped into my head because I love talking to people. I love sharing with people and I love learning and I love having my challenges solved by by the Ben's and the Dennis and the and the Andy's and the Deans, but also sharing my experience. And that's the whole thing about quid pro quo is one thing for another, paying it forward and uh, sharing your experience. So I, I'd like to thank everyone from all over the nation and a couple from around the world for joining us this evening. Desi, uh, thank you so much for facilitating this. Des, do you have anything else uh, before we before we close this up? Nope, just this was awesome. And I'm so happy that everybody can join and we look forward to having more webinars like these in the future. 
anyone else, uh, I would like to just thank you for your evening. Janine and the cats are waiting, and I'm sure a very small adult beverage is probably waiting for me as well. So take care, be well, be safe. And thank uh, you so much. thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you.